Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Madness and Mayhem podcast with me, your host, Orpheus. Yep, here on Orpheus Plays here on YouTube. It is so great to see you again for my podcast here, another episode, like I said, and uh, really looking forward to it. I've got a treat for you today. I wanted to tell you about the first radio job that I ever got. Now, this is going to be an interesting one because it'll give you kind of a behind the scenes on how things used to work back in the uh, the old days of radio, <laughs> because radio has kind of gone a little bit uh, by the wayside lately. You'll also notice I'm playing a little bit of World of Warcraft in the background. I am trying to farm up uh, some fell iron ore here in order to level up my mining. So uh, yeah, I'm playing a little bit of classic Wrath of the Lich King. Uh, that'll just be in the background here to give you something to look at. But anyway... Hope you are doing fabulous wherever you are today, whether it is day or night. And let's get things kicked off by telling you about, well, it all has to start somewhere. And for me, it was always, I was fascinated with the concept of radio. I grew up in a time when radio was like... One of the main ways that you got information and education, uh, no matter where you were in the country, you could always just flip on a little transistor radio that you bought like for five bucks at a... At a um, a gas station or something like that and you immediately have music sports talk you know all sorts of things that that can keep you completely engrossed and give you something in the background to kind of you know just fill in that uh, that kind of hole in the in the noise and everything else so it always had to kind of it was always there, I guess, uh, this idea of being able to get entertainment anywhere. And the idea that I've always loved about broadcasting is that you get invited into people's homes. You get invited into people's lives as a broadcaster. And so it's kind of like you are, are a part of their lives and yet not at the same time. It's a concept I've always loved. Well, as I grew up, I used to make my own little radio shows and stuff. I would have a little tape recorder and I'd play a little bit of music and interview my friends. And <laughs> it was always really fun to do. And so that that kind of craving for the attention and, and the radio and doing shows and stuff kind of crept up into me until I got a little older and I had gotten out of college. And I decided I wanted to be a wedding DJ, right? And so I was doing that for a while on and off. And it was like, you know, doing a six to eight hour gigs where I'm, I'm dancing and singing and having a good time with everybody, interviewing folks like, hey, what, you know, why are you here tonight? Do you know the bride or the groom? Uh, that kind of thing. And so some friends suggested, why don't you go to broadcast college? And yes, there's actually colleges that you can go to for broadcasting in TV and in radio. And so I found uh, a big, you know, kind of reputable one uh, here in the United States. And I applied and, of course, got in because, you know, I've got the radio voice going on. <laughs> now, uh, if you're wondering why I'm talking about this, I am a former broadcaster, uh, both a news and radio personality. And so uh, I've got several radio jobs that I'm going to be covering in this podcast, uh, and this will just just, you know, go through like how I got things started and then the first one. So at Broadcast College, it was always fun because it was like this. You always have had radio and television around in your lives, but you never really get to find out what it's like behind the scenes. And so the radio college, the broadcast college itself, taught you all those basics. Like uh, in the first semester, all students learned both television and radio so that you could figure out which one you had a little bit more of an affinity towards. And so we would learn things like uh, go into a TV engineering studio and learn how to use all the, the slider boards and, you know, cut from camera one to camera two and cut to commercial and, you know, produce a little news broadcasts and stuff like that. We would rotate around. I know how to use cameras <laughs> in those broadcast studios. Um, I know how to do the uh, use the teleprompter and all that stuff. But then there's the radio side. The radio side was learning how to physically splice reel-to-reel -reel tape together in order to make commercials and sound effects and things like that. Um, it was learning how to work with what's called the clock hour. So if you look at a clock, um, you go along and at uh, different intervals, there's like news, weather, sports, you know, uh, music, talk, all that stuff around the clock hour. So we would run those over and over and over again. And then you branched off to 
after the first semester into TV or radio. Uh, in the radio side, you learned uh, journalism, ethics, um, you know, that sort of thing. You learned how to how to speak correctly. I've always been told I have the Midwestern accent, which is apparently no accent at all. And so they kind of teach you that as well in broadcast college. Uh, they'll give you an idea of how to pronounce things correctly. Uh, one of the, th the examples I love to bring up is, you know, local flavor. You have to learn how to pronounce things. So one of the examples, you can write this down. This is a city in Michigan. It is spelled B-O-I-S-B-L-A-N-C. Now, you'd think that that was Bois Blanc, right? Because it's like, you know, there's French stuff in Michigan. No, that's pronounced Bablo. And if you said Bois Blanc on the radio, if you're up there, you'd sound kind of like an idiot. So <laughs> they teach you stuff like that, how to figure out how to pronounce stuff like that. And so I graduated from that college after about a year. And uh, one of the things that was neat about it is that they had this lifetime placement sort of thing. So even today, I could give them a call all these years later and say, hey, you know, I need a job in the broadcast industry. And they would go and make phone calls and, you know, try to place me at somewhere where I wanted to get a job. Well, back then, you know, they were like, well, you know, it'll be a few weeks before we can get you that job. And I said, uh, you know, I'll see what I can do as well. And so like two days after I graduated, I popped open the phone book for the entire state. And I started making phone calls and I was like, you know, I, I want to look for, you know, anything that's available in either personality, like, you know, the, the host of a, of a show or I wanted to be in news. The second place that I called was a little, you know, uh, radio station cluster about f five hours away from me. And I said, you know, hey, you guys hiring? My name's Orpheus. I just graduated from broadcast college and I'm looking for a job in news or personality. They said, you know, it's funny you called because our news person is going to be retiring here in a couple weeks. And I said, oh, OK. Um, so how, uh, you know, what, what time are you guys open until? And it was like eight o'clock in the morning or something. They're like, oh, we're open till five. You know, someone will be here at the front desk. And I said, okay, well, I'll see you before then. <laughs> and I got my, my demo tape, my resume, got a couple changes of clothes and I hopped in the car and drove up there and, uh, immediately turned in the, uh, the resume and the demo tape. Um, by the end of the day, they wanted to see me again the next day. Apparently, they already listened to it and called my, uh, my references and stuff. And by the end of the next day, I had the job. Now, the first thing that they had me do with the group was go to a, a little uh, July like summer party that the main station at the cluster was hosting. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Everybody got hammered except for me because I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't get that, you know, informal in front of everybody. So my first day of work comes and I go into the studio. I sit down with the owner and he's sitting across a uh, table from me. He says, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write down a, a number on a piece of paper here and uh, we'll uh, we'll see if that's a good uh, salary for you to open with. And uh, if you have any problems, just just let me know and we can maybe renegotiate. Well, I was just like, okay, I don't care. I just want a job. Hold on. I want to mess with this fellow reaver. Do, 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 no. Oh, nothing. Okay. Eh, whatever. Anyway, so he slides this piece of paper across the desk at me and I was so geeked. I didn't even care. I was like, he could offer me like $5,000 a year. I'd probably take the job because <laughs> I just wanted to be in radio. And so he slides this piece of paper all like, you know, consp inconspicuous, like, hey, here you go, man. And I open it up and it says $22,000 a year. Now, back then, even then, that was a not very much money at all. But there's a couple of truths when it comes to radio. The longer you stay, the more you get paid. And that doesn't matter if you suck or not. Um, and the other one is that you're going to get fired from radio jobs. And so that happens, too. It's seen as like a badge of honor for people. So I accepted that. And immediately within a couple of months, September 11th happened. And I spent 22 hours on the air broadcasting uh, all of the information, all of the updates and everything else like that for the entire area. 
And so, you know, in a small town kind of uh, kind of ex section of the country, wherever it is, like Podunk, Iowa, that kind of thing, the radio stations really were a source and the source of news and entertainment and education. Um, like on, you know, weekends, they'd have like different shows like cars and how to repair houses and stuff like that. And so when it came to a disaster like September 11th, everyone in the entire community was glued to the radios. And I suddenly quickly became the trusted voice for education and information in, you know, in that, that area. And so within months, people were demanding that I was, you know, the co-host of the morning show on the main station that I was on, because I was on four different uh, radio stations for that one company. Um, I would, ooh, nice. Just uh, just found that. Woohoo! <laughs> anyway, so I, um, I was in four different radio stations, but the main one um, was, you know, the, it was a, contemporary station like top 40 kind of stuff and so um i just kind of became the trusted thing and everyone's like you know make orpheus the co-host of the show so this this dude who uh, i was working for as the news guy um <laughs> He'd been doing this job for like 20 years in this area, and suddenly along comes Orpheus, and within months it's, you know, uh, Bob and Orpheus in the morning. <laughs> and he just is like, uh, he had to be so bummed out about that. Anyway, so it was interesting because that job, um, when you do that kind of stuff, when you, when you are uh, part of a morning show or part of, part of uh, the radio station as a personality, you have to go do things. They're called remotes. And so that means you pack up like a little broadcast uh, remote setup so you can, uh, you know, call into the radio station with your microphone and, yeah, I'm live out here at, you know, uh, the Al's hardware store and we're, we're doing a little promotion today. Uh, the first 15 people who stop by get a free t shirt and uh, enter to win in the raffle for, you know, a 4x4, four four, whatever stupid thing. And so we did those all the time. And they were just like everywhere from like hardware stores to grocery stores to like um, well, some of the ones we did gas stations and like local events and stuff like that. Since we were the morning show idiots, we had to do the stupid things in town, like dress up in those giant sumo outfits and wrestle each other on like the local news and stuff like that. I did. Uh, I hosted Survivor Night at a uh, local bar uh, every what was it Thursday. Uh, I had to go and like you know basically host a little like hey it's Orpheus from Bob and Orpheus in the morning and we're gonna you know we're gonna have some fun tonight. Bah. That was always like a a really weird way to do things um we were almost like djs for hire but like hey it's the djs from the radio station you know <laughs> but you know it, it gave us a chance to interact with people but it was so cheesy all the time because the host and i were sitting there and and like we would be in between commercials and we're just giggling like i can't believe we're at another friggin um you know <laughs> another friggin hardware store doing one of these stupid remotes giving away a jet ski or something stupid <laughs> yeah and one of the examples in what we did was uh it was a hardware store we love to do hardware stores for some reason uh it was for the big game you know this the superb owl the super bowl anyway uh we were doing one and we made a bet live on the air it was like you know if your team loses um, you'll have to wear the jersey and sing a little song. And for me, it was like, if my team loses, uh, I got to walk out on this main street wearing a Speedo and flip-flops <laughs> and holding a sign for the radio station. Well, you can probably guess uh, which team lost. Yeah, it was me. And so I had to do a little remote on the side of the road. And it was like, what was it? It was like... Whenever the Super Bowl is, January, February, whatever it is. And it was right after it, and I'm standing there, and it was, you know, this was in the northern part of the state of Michigan. <laughs> and so it's like, it's like 12 degrees outside, and I had to do like a three-minute remote. So I'm like standing inside the radio station, and I'm, I'm wearing a robe, and I'm like, okay, here we go, here we go. And I fling the robe off, I go running out to the street, and I'm like, yeah, I'm out here live, and so the traffic going by, it is really cold out here. You hear people driving by going, free and stuff they're laughing and everything <laughs> so i did that for three minutes come back in i'm like i hate you so much dude i bob you i i hate you so much <laughs> for doing that well um you know 
I also did a lot of studio work, so that's where I kind of developed uh, some of the voices that I do. Yeah, you know, do, do, do the Arnold and stuff because we do commercials. You know, it's like, uh, hello, this is your your good friend Arnold. You should listen to Bob and Orpheus in the morning. You know, stuff like that. Um, I learned how to do all sorts of old man voices, and like uh, Bullwinkle the Moose was the one that I did a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's when I can... Oh, what the hell? Excuse me, the eighth mouth squirrel go flying through here. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and it was just... It gave me a chance to develop some of those skills that I went on to use. Not only in other radio jobs, but I did a little bit of uh, voiceover work for cartoons and for... Um, some stuff like IMAX and, and like cable companies and things like that as the, the years went along. And it was always... it You know... The, the skills that you learn in that kind of pay it forward, as it were, so, you know, you build on it. And that's why even if you kind of suck in broadcasting, you keep getting paid more because it's like you can suck as a driver, but you eventually get to a point where driving becomes second nature. And that's kind of how I like to uh, uh, tell people that go into broadcasting. You walk into that studio or if you walk or you see an engineering studio for like a, a, a record company and there's that huge engineering board with like 5,000 knives and all the sliders and plugs and everything. <laughs> well, it's kind of like when you first start driving, right? And you've got your hands locked on the wheel at 10 and 2. And you're like, I, I'm, I'm just going to stare straight ahead. I'm going to check my mirror. Okay, I'm checking my mirror. Okay, now we're going to very carefully put it into drive. And we're going to lightly depress the gas. And we're going to merge. Yeah, okay, so cut to like, you know, six months later. And you're driving with your knee, eating a cheeseburger, talking to your friend on the phone. Stuff like that. <laughs> it is just silly how much like you know uh how much stuff you are able to do after a short period of time and that's kind of how broadcasting works um, the longer you do it the the more comfortable you get with doing it so let's talk about how i got fired um this was after a couple of years of working this job um, we used to do giveaways every morning, several times a morning, and it was like, you know, call in with some trivia answer or sing a silly song or whatever we wanted people to do in order to win that day's contests, right? And so uh, one of the things that we used to give away was um, these vouchers for a local fast food place. So you could get like a, a value meal or a breakfast meal or whatever it was. Well, about 60% of people don't actually ever pick those things up, even probably to this day. If it's a t-shirt or South, most people probably are not going to go and you know make a priority to go pick that thing up. And if it's just a voucher for like, one meal, one combo meal at a fast food place, they're going to be like, meh, you know, whatever. So they sat in this box up at the front desk forever, right? And so what happened, the person would come in and you'd give a little scribble on it and you'd give it to them and go, okay, there you go. That's, that's your little meal. You go off and get that. Well, uh, the girl that I was dating at the time, who then became my ex-wife... <laughs> I guess that's the easiest way to put it. Uh, she kept asking if she could take some of those because at her job, you know, she we weren't making a lot of money. Uh, we had moved in together and she's like, you know, can we just grab those and have them once in a while? And I'm like, yeah, you know, why not? And I put a little scribble for my name on it because I could authorize them as well. It's like a little uh, business card coupon. And so the manager and the owner of that fast food company, they were taking a hit, right? They were doing advertising with us. But like if someone came in and redeemed that value, voucher, well, you know, there's money out of their pocket that they have to write off as, you know, promotion stuff. Well, th these, this fast food place was, it was a franchise, but it was one that was owned by him. So he ate all those costs himself. Okay. So since about 60% of people did not go to get those things, he kind of relied on the fact that it didn't cost as much every month. Well, they suddenly started getting redeemed at an alarming rate, and all of those <laughs> redemptions were suddenly coincidentally from my signature on them. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Either one of two things, either that's not a big deal and what the hell, or or it could be that, oh my God, you're stealing and what the hell's wrong with you. Either way, uh, I was making almost no money. I didn't see anything wrong with it because people weren't um, weren't redeeming those things. And I didn't have the, the you know hindsight that I have now to see that there was a business cost associated with it. And so that was one of the things I got busted for. And that would kind of put me on the double secret probation at work. You know, they're like, one more thing, Orpheus, and you're out of here. 
<laughs> well, the other thing that happened was my uh, then girlfriend, later to be my ex-wife, uh, started writing bad checks in town. And a couple of them were from my checking account and some of them were from her checking account. And then she got busted uh, for <laughs> stealing from a local loan place. And since it was connected to me and my, you know, it was like we made it a public thing on during the show that she was my girlfriend and stuff like that. And so because guilt by association plus my little Deborah's double secret probation and boom, there you go. I uh, lost that job. And the funny thing is when they brought me in, when the owner brought me in, he was so pissed because he was a local business owner and he was like a pillar of the community kind of thing. And so this made him look really bad to his friends. And, and like <laughs> he knew the sheriff personally, their families hung out. And so he had to deal with that. I never got in trouble for the checks because I never wrote them. It was really obviously in her handwriting. And so she got busted a little bit for that. She didn't have to do any time or anything. Thing. She got a couple of misdemeanors out of it, but it made the radio station and the owner look bad. And so he brought me into the conference room, the same one that he slid that piece of paper across to me, right? <laughs> At the beginning of my job. And he goes, you know, you are out of here. I can't believe this. This is ridiculous. You know, I, this is a you know serious violation and everything. It's making me look terrible. And so I got no other choice but to get rid of you. And I was like, yeah, whatever, dude. And he's like, and with the, the stupid fast food thing, he's like, you, I, you were the, you know, the most, least, un, least professional. He was like going off on me. And I'm like, what the hell, dude? I, I didn't do anything wrong. I boosted your ratings and everything. <laughs> like, come on, man. So he got so pissed. He made me take off my radio station polo shirt that I was wearing. <laughs> He's like, you take that damn thing off. I'm giving you one of the uh, shirts out of the prize closet. That's some piece of crap one that we gave away for free. And so, yeah, he had me take the shirt off and put on another one. And uh, I'm standing out there in the parking lot. And I was just like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> anyway, that's the story of my first radio job. Got fired, uh, packed up the car shortly after that because we couldn't afford our rent. My girlfriend and I, we packed up our car and we drove to North Carolina. And that will be chapter two of my first radio jobs <laughs> on the next Madness and Mayhem podcast. I really hope you've enjoyed this uh, episode, kind of a, an overview of what it was like to get a first job and what it might be like if you get a job in radio, uh, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. So anyway, do good, be good, and treat yourself well, because you know what? You deserve it. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye.